I'm Lele Hoyuram. Welcome to Decolonizing Aladdin, or Chinese Hegemony on the Silk Road, or A Whole New World, the Silk Road City of Aladdin. In my adult life, I'm a storyteller, artist, and educator in Hawaiian culture and art. Why? As a girl, I had terrible asthma. There was really no good treatment at the time, so many nights I sat up in bed with a steam pot of Vic vapor rub beside me to ease my lungs as I struggled to breathe. During those pain-filled nights, my mother taught me to read, and I worked my way through stacks of books. A Thousand and One Arabian Nights was among my favorites, and I traveled with Aladdin and Sinbad, and on the magical ebony horse, I eased the pain in my chest by living within the lush illustrations of Arthur Rackham and Walter Crane. When I was adventuring with Aladdin and his kind, I did not hurt. The art of the storyteller was my salvation. Now, for over 40 years, storytelling has been my passion and my profession. Today, I use a variety of media to tell stories, and I use stories to teach Hawaiian culture and art. In the past few years, I've begun to teach the art of storytelling. It's a delight to me to return to the stories that first fed my passion and re-examine them from a new perspective. As a teacher of Hawaiian culture and arts, I am delighted each time that modern archeology span and geology confirm the stories of our kupuna, our elders. Each time I read in the journals about yet another confirmation, I am thrilled and impressed with the wisdom of my Hawaiian ancestors. When I was growing up, we were told that people could not possibly have accomplished the things that they did, massive aquaculture projects, or known about geological events that formed our islands because they were too primitive. But now, science is proving our ancestors right. But it is not only Hawaiians who are subject to this. My Irish ancestors' accomplishments and wisdom were devalued by colonialist settlers. And the stories of my Chinese ancestors have been dismissed by the descendants of European enlightenment as being fantastical and therefore impossible. Rather than reading the poetry and using it as a cover which protects the truth written within the pages of our traditional lore, since the Age of Enlightenment, all narratives except that of the educated Anglo-European man were dismissed. I also am a descendant of the Chinese diaspora, how my ancestors migrated across China and then across oceans is of intense interest to me. In the opportunity to explore the story of Alauddin, I am delighted to indulge both these passions. Here, I shall endeavor to use the lens of Chinese hegemony rather than Indo-European enlightenment to explore a little bit on the story of Alauddin and his wonderful lamp. I'd like to begin thanking the organizers, my fellow presenters, and you, the participants, for making this seminar possible. Bringing the perspectives of a variety of voices to the narratives of the Silk Route is so important to their understanding. It is my hope that this little presentation of mine will inspire you to delve even deeper into the history, stories, and cultures of the Silk Route and elevate the voices of those with deeper cultural ties. For links, images, and discussion of topics in this presentation, please visit the Facebook group, Decolonizing Aladdin. From the first time my mother read me the story, I knew that Aladdin takes place in China. It says so right in the book. And to my five-year-old mind, the lush illustrations were proof enough. It was only upon seeing Disney's treatment of the story and how badly, in my opinion, the cultural setting was misrepresented, that I reread it and realized that my own childhood dreams were false too. 
No, the story was not set in an orientalized Western gaze vision of 19th century Canton. Fortunately, research delights me as much as any magic carpet. The origin of Aladdin and the magic lamp is today a controversial subject among some of the scholars who study such things. To many English speakers, it is one of the world's great pieces of literature. To those descendants of its own culture, it simply is one of many such stories. We do not know who originally composed it or even how old it is. There's some evidence that it takes elements from older, simpler stories, which were stitched together and then embroidered with elements from the life and adventures of one Antun Yusuf Hamad Yad. We do know that this story is not part of the original canon of 1001 Nights. It and many other tales were added by Antoine Galan, the behest of his publisher. We do know that Yad, a Syrian born in 1688, met with Galan and shared many stories with him. We do not know how closely Galan kept to the stories Diab shared. Galan's version and the English translations of it and subsequent interpretations often are rife with Orientalism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia. In my presentation, I'm not going to address these issues, however others already are doing so. What I am going to address is the 20th and 21st century Western assumption that although the author repeatedly cites China as the setting, the tale cannot be set in China because Aladdin is described as Muslim and the city in which he dwells has what some critics have called a mishmash of Middle Eastern and Asian cultures which supposedly shows that the city cannot be set in China. If one admits to Muslim presence in China, the excuse is made that one cannot expect the Syrian storyteller to know the geography and history of Chinese cities. I also am going to briefly address the erasure of multiculturalism, and I'm going to briefly address the Eurocentric lens through which the story has been viewed past several generations makes the following assumption. One, the storyteller did not know his story. Two, the story could not have taken place in China. Three, China is simply shorthand for somewhere far away. Therefore, the story must take place somewhere in the Arab speaking world. This presumably because Muslim equals Arab. Exotic cities, or exotic cities are monolithic, so all members will subscribe to the same religious beliefs, cultural mores, and ethics. They have simplistic social interactions. I am going to address these by positing that one, Yab was very familiar with his story. Two, the story did take place in China. Three, China is a specific place, not just somewhere far away. Four, trade cities are cosmopolitan metropolises with diverse religious beliefs, cultural mores, attire, food preferences, and have complex social interactions. A little history. A hundred years before Common Era, Mithridate, king of Parthia in modern-day Iran, sent ambassadors to Sula of Rome and Wu Di of China to establish trade. Within a generation, silk was available in Rome. Within a hundred years, Rome sent its own ambassador to China. Soon, the Roman, Parthian, Kushan, and Chinese governments established diplomatic relations to assure the safety of trade along the Silk Road. As time rolled on, the small camps and oases along the route grew into cosmopolitan cities of trade as some of the nomadic families of the areas began to remain at the old encampments, expanding. Also, as time went on, the Qin and Han dynasties of China 
expanded their hegemony and established garrisons to protect the cities they now saw as their own from the bandits who were attracted to the wealth they began to hold. Over the next several hundred years, trade expanded and so the Silk Route expanded. Trade ranged from legally, legally acquired and sold goods to stolen or smuggled contraband to industrial espionage, such as the theft of silkworms, titular silk, myriad spices, precious and semi-precious stones, exotic animals, foodstuffs, and even human might be bought and sold along the route or taken as far as possible to sell for the best price. Not only goods traveled the route, knowledge in the arts and sciences also was carried along. Culture and religion moved both ways. Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, Taoism, Confucianism, Tengrism, Shamanism, and other beliefs and practices traveled with the arts, sciences, and goods. In the 7th century, at the beginning of the Tang Dynasty, the Silk Road entered its golden age. People from around the known world came to the Chinese court to make deals with the, uh, with the politicians there, with the increasing trade with China. So through the, through the 7th century, the Silk Road's golden age, Trade expanded, hegemony expanded, but then in the 8th century, the Tang Dynasty fell into corruption. The threads holding together the intricate trade route began to fray. Succeeding dynasties implemented isolationist rather than expansionist policies. The Ottoman Empire also cut trade and expanding sea routes and more capable ships made the ocean routes more lucrative and the increasingly dangerous northern route less lucrative. Eventually, many of the outposts and some of the cities they had protected returned to the sands from which they had been built. One of the reasons for discrediting Diab is that his city is a mishmash of Middle Eastern and Asian cultures. If the city is on the northern Silk Road in the Taksamokan portion of the Silk Route, it will indeed be a mishmash of Middle Eastern and Asian cultures. Such cities were cosmopolitan nodes of commerce for over a thousand years. One of the reasons virtually any Middle Eastern or Asian merchant would have knowledge of the Silk Route such knowledge would have been common to merchants dealing in Silk Route goods for at least a millennium before Diab's time, even though the golden age of the northern Silk Road had passed. For Diab to not hold such knowledge would make as much sense as for an educated person who has traveled internationally to be unaware that Londinium, Venice, Hong Kong, or any other major international trade center of any time would have been a thriving cosmopolitan identity. One way we know the history of such places is that then, as now, customs, duties, taxes, passports, purchase orders, and invoices all applied to legally imported goods and those who transported them. In fact, such paperwork, whether on bamboo slips detailing the silk that is being manufactured and sold along the route. Clay tablets that talk about other products, parchment or paper. These are all treasure troves for all manner of demographic data on those who lived before us, providing information on everything, migration patterns to crop yield. Extensive archeology span has been and is being done, which pushes our knowledge of the history of these cities back ever farther in time, and our knowledge of their trade routes ever farther across the world. Not only silk was transported, but spices, pottery, animals, equipment, mineral ores, 
all manner of things and people could be purchased. Here we see the paperwork for goods, including a 15-year-old person. China's desire for foreign goods resulted in strong trade relationships with an ever-expanding set of partners until the Ottoman Empire began trade restrictions. As China grew, it supported trade by extending military protection over sometimes unwilling excuse me, cities along the Silk Route and by establishing garrisons to protect critical portions of the route. The role of a storyteller is to know things and to disseminate this knowledge in an entertaining format. Traditional storytellers were and are libraries of their culture. Like libraries, they contain the classics, the most recent bestsellers, and the newspapers of their culture. Like libraries, some specialize in detailed knowledge for specific subjects. Medical libraries and legal libraries come immediately to mind. And some are more general in their acquisition curating everything from children's stories to books on astrophysics. To decide that a storyteller such as Diab is ignorant of other lands and does not know what he is talking about because he didn't go there is like deciding that if a library contains books about places beyond the city limits, those books are inaccurate. As a storyteller, I feel a certain kinship with Diab and his ilk. Those sitters in the coffee houses who spin tales for pleasure and profit, like him, when telling the tales with which I have been entrusted, I must choose between the need to preserve a story as it has been told and handed down for generations, and the need to freshen the story by adding spices and colors, as it were, to suit the taste and attract the eye of the current generation. In preparation for this presentation, in addition to the volumes I had enjoyed as a child, I read additional English translations of the story, including Sir Richard Burton and anonymous collaborative translations of Galland's French version and online dictionary at the ready, struggled upstream through a river of Galland's French. Because no written accounts of the story prior to Galland have yet been found, we cannot know what choices Diab made in his telling or how those choices were interpreted and edited by Galan. But I believe Diab made, I believe Diab knew exactly what he was talking about. He was a man who continuously sought knowledge. He was an educated man. He spoke Arabic and French and quite possibly was familiar with Aramaic. He was enticed to work as an interpreter for the Frenchman Paul Lucas by promises of employment in the Royal Library at Versailles. His dream job was to curate knowledge. He traveled with Lucas and met with Louis XIV. He was familiar with the classical literature of his day. He could read and translate medieval Arabic texts. Later in life, he owned books, no mean accomplishment in that day and he wrote his autobiography. We can use it to get an idea of his writing style and tease out his contribution to the story, just as scholars use it to verify his employer, Paul Lucas's version of the event. There is no reason to suppose Diab would be unaware of the historical main cities renowned in legend along the main trade route of one of his country's largest trade partners. Looking at various media depictions of Aladdin through the 20th and 21st centuries, I found that the modern writers located his city everywhere from Tunisia to Iran. Nobody put it in China. In fact, the only time I ever saw it depicted in China was in a public broadcasting service presentation in the 1990s. Although the story clearly said China, the princess was wearing an elaborate kimono and wig in the style of a mic a geisha in training. Aladdin wore a kaftan, which actually was probably
probably more accurate than many other Aladdin costumes I've seen. If we look at other images, you'll see there are some similarities, even going back to the seventh century. Back to my big gray. The city in Disney's lap, Agra, is a stand-in for Baghdad. But when we look at the various translations of the Diab Salan story, it is clear. Diab City al Khalal is in China. al Khalas is people with a variety of characters, including merchants and others, people of all classes, from the sultan to the impoverished, who are permanent residents, and the itinerant, whether they be upstanding traders or more nefarious individuals. Diab mentions some merchants, artisans with a descriptive facility that assures one he has spent time in the presence of their clients. One has the feeling that his brief but well-drawn sketches of Alauddin wandering through the market, watching, observing, learning all that he can comes from his own life. In fact, after returning to Aleppo, after his adventures, Diab did become a successful cloth merchant, putting to use all he had learned in his travel. Al-Khalas is typical of trade cities across Asia and Europe throughout the era. In a trade city, which each of the cities along the Silk Route certainly were, one would see examples of dress and cultural practice from throughout the known world. I posit that Diab was the equal of any European author in his attention to detail and historical authenticity, and that he created Al-Khalas as an imaginary city set in the time of the original 1001 night as an amalgam of several the northern silk road of the Takamaka. Taking the stance that Akalas is a city in China, we can look at it for clues to the habits and mores of an earlier time, just as we do with the Hawaiian myths and legends and with European fairy tales. Rather than seeing a story from a Eurocentric perspective, which homogenizes all of China into a 1920s version of Canton and places all Muslim culture in Baghdad, we should be willing to trust the story's integrity, listen to it, and test it to see if it holds true. In this, the history and archaeology of Chinese cities on the Silk Route is our ally. With them, we can try to see the city of Alauddin, Alauddin's mother, and the lady Bahir al Budur. In learning about Yabs al Khalas, we can learn a little of Chinese hegemony as an integral part of the expansion of the Silk Route. Wait, what? Mother? Lady Badur al Budur? Alauddin and his city are not the only ones who get a raw deal in the modern retellings of the story. In the Diab Galan telling, our hero's mother plays an important role, discovering the power of the lamp and acting as intermediary between her son and the sultan in trying to arrange Alauddin's marriage to the sultan's daughter, the lady Badur al Kutur. The love interest? No, she's not Jasmine. Love interest of Alauddin is Badur al Budur, full moon of full moon. Our hero himself is Alauddin, nobility of faith. Who would the characters have been? What would their lives have been like, their homes? What would they have eaten? How would they have dressed? To learn about them, let's start the city in which they live. By the time Diab shared the story of Alauddin, the northern silk road of the Tlamakan had extended from city to city until it stretched some 4,000 kilometers, bloomed with wealth into a golden age, seen the rise and fall of dynasties, and then faded back into the desert, leaving only a few lonely outposts, separated cities, and icing tales, bygone glory, wealth, and adventure. In its glory, merchants from throughout Africa 
the Mediterranean, and even parts of Europe, as well as merchants from throughout Asia, carried their wares across its sand-scoured tracks. In general, the cities along the northern Silk Road and the Cockneys and portions of the Silk Route had begun as encampments beside oases, and as time passed, grew into permanent communities with economies based largely on supplying the needs of the caravans which passed through them. Due to the confluence of traders from around the known world, those that grew into cities were cosmopolitan, polyglot, and interreligious, while many of the original Silk Route cities have long since been buried beneath the sands of time, others still exist today. For myself, I suspect that Alcalas is a composite of several cities along the Silk Route. One of the arguments I've heard against the veracity of Siob's telling is that because no one knows anything about a city named Alcalas, Siob did not know what he was talking about. In my less than humble opinion, if Disney can take the story out of China, put it in Baghdad, and then change the name of Baghdad to Agrabah, Siob can certainly make up the name of his city. And, as it turns out, perhaps the name Al-Kalas is not such a stretch at all. Kala, possibly the root word of Kalas, translates from Arabic to English as fort. Al-Kalas could be a variation on the fort. As a number of cities on the Takamakan portion of the Silk Route were garrison cities, Calling a city, which is essentially a fictionalized composite of them, the fort, suddenly makes perfect sense. Some translations call Al Kalas the capital city of China. If we consider the story as taking place during the height of the Silk Road era, during the Tang Dynasty, it could be that this is a reference to Chang'an, China's then capital and start of the northern Silk Road of the Taklamaka. But I expect it is just a literary device to make the city sound more impressive. Chang'an, today known as Tian, is the easternmost of the northern route cities and lies near the confluence of the Wei and Feng rivers, providing reliable water and transportation. They made the site an ideal location for several important imperial capitals through almost a millennium of Chinese history. Mountains, caves, and hot springs surround the plain on which it rests. The capital of the Qin Dynasty, 221 to 206 BC, was just north of today's modern version. It is famous for the massive tomb complex of the Qin emperors, which contains more than 8,000 terracotta statues spread over some 56 square kilometers. Chang'an was a cosmopolitan city with residents from many lands and many faiths. Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, more a philosophy than a religion, Zoroastrianism, Nestorianism, and Manchiism were practiced. South Indian, North Indian, Salinese, Kuchian, Korean, and Japanese monks were among the foreigners residing in the city. By the mid-700s common era, census records show that Chang'an was populated by almost one million people, of which 5,000 were foreigners. Excuse me, just a minute. Kashgar. The westernmost of China's Silk Route cities, Kashgar enjoys a lake and has nearby hills. During the golden age of the Northern Silk Road, Kashgar was a city of the Kocharan, a people of the Sassanid Empire. Whether the city was under Sassanid or Tang control, well, that is a question for students of political history. In addition to the local Kocharan population, Uyghurs, Chinese, Indians, Armenians, too, Russians, Amirs, all lived in Kashgar and even intermarried with the local Uyghur women. These people represented Muslim, Hindu, 
Buddhist, Christian, and other religions. Kashgar was known for gardens and the beauty of its surroundings. These attributes may have contributed to the diversity on lush gardens. Yab talks about in his descriptions of Kalkala. Sadly, China is today systematically destroying the unique beauty and architectural history of Kashgar to create a disnified, cynicized, and politicized vision of this historic Uyghur city. Umoh, now known as Aksu during the Han Dynasty, was a kingdom of 3,500 households and 24,500 individuals, including 4,500 people able to bear arms. Chinese civil servants were nothing if not accurate in collecting data. Its major industries were the production of copper, iron, and perfume, a valuable pigment used in everything from art to apothecary and from alchemy to assassination. The territory of Humo was roughly situated in the counties of Baicheng and Wenzhe, and the city of Atsu of nowadays. The area was known for its fine cotton and hemp cloth. Alauddin's mother spun cotton yarn for her living and also wove her clothing from the threads. She then sewed that cloth into her clothing. Tales of this city may have inspired the description of her profession. Nearby, there is a complex of hundreds of caves which were carved into Buddhist shrines. Few of them can be seen in this image over here, right there. Each of those shrines is named. Descriptions of these caves may have provided some inspiration for the cave of the genie. Many other cities also had large, have large cave complexes nearby. So it's a recurring theme for the garrison cities of the Taklamaka. To me, it makes perfect sense that various tales of these cities were woven together to create the fabric of Yab's tale, which he then embroidered with events inspired by his own life. For instance, when Yab and his French employer, Paul Lucas, were on the way to Tripoli, they stopped at Kastin to spend the day. Lucas hired guards and pack horses, and they set off to explore the nearby mountains. Once there, he found various interesting archaeological sites, including a tomb in a cave. None of his hired guards would go in to explore it, so he hired a local goat herd who happened to be in the area. The goat herd climbed down into the tomb. As Job recounts in his autobiography, the goat herd did as he was told and found a human skull. The goat herd handed us another skull, smaller than the first. The goss tossed a piece of cloth into the cave and told him, collect everything you find on the floor of the tomb and hand it to me. The goat herd gathered what he found and handed it all over. Among the objects was a large plain ring. Feel around the walls of the tomb, Lucas told him. The goat herd did as instructed and found a niche inside. Inside the niche was a lamp, similar to those used by the butter merchant. There we see jewel, which Diab stitch into the fabric of his narrative. It is not that Diab had no knowledge of the northern Silk Road cities and so made stuff up. Rather, I believe this is evidence that he understood well the narratives about them and then enhanced them with jewels from his experience, shining threads from his imagination. Let's take a look at the structure of all colors. about going back to map time on there it was gated as were most cities of the time and place chinese held cities on the taklamakan generally were basically garrison forts Either through negotiation or through conquest, China established garrisons along the northern Silk Road 
extending its reach city by city, approximately 4,000 kilometers to Kashgar. It had mosques. Diab specifically mentions mosques as a feature of the city. Thus, we can infer there is a large Muslim population, as there were many, as there were in many of the Taklamakan cities. In the golden era of the Silk Road, Islam was a new and rapidly growing faith. The Tang Dynasty was in place from 610 to 907 Amun era. I include the reign of Wu Zetian as in part of that because she was indeed a portion of the Tang. Muhammad lived from 570 to 632 Amun era. I expect that in play are both Yab's experience of visiting predominantly Muslim cities in his travels and the rapid spread of Islam along the trade route being remembered in stories passed down from that time. Another bit of evidence we have is that shops in Alcala are shut on Friday. Today, this indicates a predominantly Muslim population. We do not know if other faiths of that time reserve Friday for worship. We do not know if it is mandated or if there are simply enough shopkeepers who close on Fridays that it became the general custom. Again, I suggest that both storytelling tradition and the personal experience play a part in this. Al-Khalas was landscape, garden. Diab talks about Allahuddin and the magician looking at gardens as they walk through the city and then out of the city, through the gardened areas of outlying homes and to the mountains with their caves. Such gardens were features in many prosperous areas and a source of pride for the city. The city had available water. In the descriptions, a river lies near Al-Khalas. Rather than the cities being arid establishments dependent entirely on what little water an overused oasis might provide, modern archaeologists using drones are finding that some of the northern Silk Route cities have irrigation systems which allowed for agriculture, public and private gardens. And the stories hold true. Hot springs. If public baths were so enticing, the would use them rather than her own private bath. They must have been built over the hot springs, which can be found in cities at the western end of the route. Among bathhouses were an important part of life in Muslim cities, in areas influenced by Muslim culture, and for everyone, they were convivial gathering places. al Qa'as is populous, available water, location on a trade route, and a defensible location with China-provided troops, allowed the no northern Silk Road cities to support large populations. And it was prosperous. The aforementioned attributes allowed for a strong economy. Diversity in the economy provided stability, with merchants selling a variety of goods, and providing public baths, dining places, everything you need to enjoy city life. A large suburban population lives outside the city walls. As Chinese hegemony expanded, intertribal war warfare was quelled to some degree, allowing the urban population to establish holdings outside of the area protected by the garrison walls. In the event of attack, these families take refuge within the walls, though likely at the expense of losing goods and crops. And Alcala is near a mountainous region with a A. Now, getting back to our feng shui map. Feng shui, literally wind water, began in ancient times as a shamanic civil engineering system which sought to position cities to best take advantage of the flow pattern of cooling mountain air in the summer the ability of mountains to block the brunt of winter storms in the Taklamakan, protection from sandstorms would be critical. The nearby river and any other water sources also would be taken into account. The expanding Chinese civil service allowed for the mobilization of financial, human, and material resources to utilize these natural resources 
and engage in massive public works to support China's increasing population, mitigate weather-based disasters, and continue the expansion of trade. We need to remember that culture evolves across time and distance. Over a 4,000 kilometer stretch and across a thousand years, the culture of the Northern Silk Road changed dramatically. Thus, we need to narrow our focus if we are to seek culturally accurate representation of the character. I'm going to set my working time period as about 650 Common Era, during the reign of Wu Zetian, one of China's more capable and powerful emperors. Expansionist policies helped create the legendary supremacy of China's Silk Route, and who was, incidentally, a woman. I call her emperor rather than empress because in Chinese tradition, the two roles are quite different. Wu Zetian ruled as an emperor through her reign as emperor, though her reign as emperor was titled Wu Zhou, it is essentially part of the Tang, vilified by later Confucian inspired detractors. Her crimes were no worse than those of most other emperors, except that they were committed by a woman. Nonetheless, she persisted. After the Tang Dynasty, Chinese hegemony was fraying due to corruption within the imperial court and administration. Later, the Song Dynasty began to re-extend China's sway, but without the efficiency and power of the earlier Tang. In Wu Zetian's time, Islam was a very young religion. The lives Muhammad and Wu Zetian actually overlap, with Muhammad living from around 570 to 632 Common Era, and Wu Zetian living from 624 to 705. China would not have been dealing with the political entities we now think of as dominating the Middle East but rather, they would have been dealing with the Sassanids of Persia. I am inordinately delighted that the original story of Leila Valela, 1001 Night, set during the reign of the fictional Sassanid king, Shahriyar, originally was told during the same time period in which the story of Alauddin. If we stand in China as the Middle Kingdom, we look out upon expanding horizons in almost every direction. From the Middle Kingdom perspective, China has extended peace and order to the edges of the civilized world. In fact, created the civilized world, increasing trade and prosperity for all nations. The Tang Dynasty is considered the golden age of China. It is a time of invention, intercultural exchange, and artistic innovation. Public libraries were built and became the foundation of education for the masses. Engineering and technology advanced, enabling the invention of mechanized creations to automate everything from clocks to waterworks, gunpowder, waterproofing, fireproofing, gas stoves, and air conditioning as well as agricultural machines to speed up the process of planting, irrigating, and harvesting crops were developed. And all of that was managed by one of the world's largest civil service systems. Back to our story. One of the things that stood out for me as I reread the story over a half century from when I first listened to my mother read it to me is that Alauddin's mother prostrated herself before the sultan of the city. As a Syrian Maronite Christian who had traveled in Muslim communities, Diab was acutely aware of the importance of strict observance of religious protocol. In his autobiography, he even states that he was uncomfortable stepping outside of protocol, even when encouraged to do so by his host. 
and in his travels, he experienced violence as a result of accidentally failing to observe local custom. And yet, Balan writes, Le maire de la ville, Saint-François, nous pauvres du monde, où est ce posterna selon la coutume? Excuse my pronunciation, very bad at French. Aladdin's mother advanced to the foot of the throne where she bowed down according to custom. Aladdin's mother is described as prostrating herself before the Sultan of the Sistan. A Muslim woman would not prostrate herself before a temporal leader. And it is not permissible for a Muslim ruler to require that people prostrate themselves before him. Therefore, I suggest that neither the Sultan of Al-Palaz nor Alauddin's mother were Muslim. All we have is Galan's Postana and Burton's prostrate. I wish I knew what word Diab chose to describe this interaction. Did he have more finesse in his description? Was he perhaps talking about the Kotal? If it were, then perhaps she was a Tang woman. In ethnic Chinese. Another point of protocol is that the servants of the Sultan's palace mistook Alauddin's elaborately clothed enslaved people for royalty and were about to kiss the hems of their garments. Again, this is not a Muslim practice. It can be found as a practice in some Christian and some Buddhist sects. I don't know if it is practiced in other faiths, of which there were several in the Silk Route city. In addition to Islam, a number of other and far older religions were practiced in the Northern Road city. Shamanism, Hengrism, Buddhism, Manichaeism, Nestorian Christianity, all were practiced by the Tocharians, Uyghurs, and other groups. What religion the Sultan and Alauddin's mother have followed? I do not think that at this time there's any way to know other than not Islam. So in reconstructing, you have a lot of latitude. I believe the Sultan would have been either a local leader working as the garrison commander or a Tang Chinese official sent to manage the city. The word Sultan does not necessarily imply an Arab leader, as Diab calls Louis XIV the Sultan of France. As China engaged in westward hegemonic expansion, Chinese imperial officials often were sent to manage cities in the hinterland. Some of these officials brought their own families, some lived as bachelors during their term, and some married local women. Another possibility is that the Sultan is local and married to a peacekeeping bride, a young woman of rank who has been sent as a political bride to establish peace between China and its allies. In either case, this would make the princess, the Lady Badr al-Budur, of dual heritage. Chinese officials were adept at integrating local practice into social situations to pacify the local populace. Combined with economic incentives, intermarriage, and military presence for enforcement, China was highly effective in extending hegemony westward and southward through the Tang Dynasty and then sporadically in successive dynasties. Expansion was interrupted during times of imperial corruption, but when implemented without corruption, Chinese rule was effective at stabilizing a vast economy and pacifying a huge land base filled with diverse cultures. What did all these diverse people eat? With populations concentrating in small areas, Intensive agriculture and trade were increasingly important in stabilizing the food supply. Food varied by location, season, and cultural group. But items mentioned in the story include wine, meat, white bread, cakes, dried fruit, and cakes and dried fruits also were used as travel, as travel food, packed up 
in two bags and taken along. And fruit at a meal was served for dessert, fresh fruit for dessert. I find it interesting that one of the plot points in our story is made around the difference between Chinese and Moroccan wine. Clothing. What would people wear in this diverse milieu? In choosing appropriate clothing to depict these characters, there's a lot of latitude. While the heyday of the Northern Silk Road pretty much is contemporaneous with the Tang Dynasty, roughly 600 Common Era to 900 Common Era, a case can be made for any time between around 300 before Common Era to 1200 Common Era, more or less the Sixth Dynasty period through the Song Dynasty. In any era, what people wear is largely determined by who they are. Let's get to know these people. The authors, Yab, a Maronite Christian, our storyteller was Maronite Christian. So we need to remember that everything is told through that lens and then retold through the translation of a French Christian Orientalist. And then for those of us who speak English, retold through the translation of the French by English people raised in the Christian tradition. For Sir Richard Burton. Sir Richard Burton was an atheist. Although a member of the Church of England, he studied Sufism, was an Orientalist, sex-obsessed, and a bit of an outlier, however you try to diagram it. Considering that Diab was a Christian, I doubt that he would have included so many Muslim expressions as we find in the Burton translation. In comparing the Galan translation composition to other translations, I find that Burton had significantly more idioms and ex Muslim idioms and expressions than were in Galan text. Antoine Galan, French writer and Orientalist, who translated Diab's stories to French and may or may not have made significant alterations. He did not bother to credit Diab, but fortunately we have some of Diab's own writing in his autobiography. Plus the note that Paul Lucas took to help us keep things together. Our characters. Given the information available, there are a number of ways to interpret the characters. These are simply my own suggestions to show possibility. Allah Uddin, as the Tocharians were the dominant ethnic group in Kashgar at the time and were known to intermarry with Uyghurs, I'm going to make Allah Uddin the child of a Tocharian man and the Uyghur woman. I'm going to say, based on the descriptions of our young man as a ne'er-do-well and sluggard, that he really is somewhat a-religious, though he does have a moment of prayer when he realizes that his supposed uncle has turned back. The cave scene also gives us the most detailed image of his clothing. Prior to his bald uncle taking him in hand, though, we don't really have a description of his dress. All we know is that he runs about with the other ne'er-do-wells of the city. I would then assume that as he and his mother are quite poor, and she makes her own clothing, that she also makes his. She's a spinner of cotton thread and a seamstress. So I would suggest that his clothing is made from the cotton cloth that she weaves and then she sews. Simple clothing, but sturdy, much like that worn by these farmers. Once his uncle takes him in hand, he is taken through the various market stalls and items purchased for him. He's treated to a suit of silk. This suit, described when he gets through the cave, as voluminous enough that the skirts must be tucked up for him to be able to climb about. We are fortunate to have access to a number of murals from this area which depict Tocharian people. These images are of wealthy young men. Allah Uddin's late father, Mustafa. The Mustafa is a Tocharian tailor, 
I will say that as a young man, he traveled the world, learned about Islam and took up that faith while learning his trade as a tailor. Enticed by stories, the merchants who brought the cloth told, he traveled with a caravan on the Northern Silk Road and after meeting Allah Uddin's mother while trading in al Qas, he married her and settled there, resuming the trade of tailor. While he was alive, they were not wealthy, but had enough. After his death, poverty overcame the mother and son. Allah Uddin's mother. There are several options for her religious faith, but I have decided she is a Uyghur woman who follows Hinduism. Hinduism does not proselytize, and one of the values is to honor and get along with other people and their beliefs. She is descended from the northern nomadic people, but her own family have been city dwellers for a few generations. By profession, she's a spinner of cotton thread and also a seamstress. She will do anything for her son. These well-dressed noblewomen might be good inspiration for Allah Uddin's mother after she is comfortable wearing silk and jewel. Bhattur al-Budur, I shall make her Buddhist due to her Chinese mother's faith and exploring Islam. We know of this interest because she asked the holy woman Fatima to live with her and teach her. The only real stipulation laid out for her dress in the story is that the lady Bhattur al-Budur is veiled when in public. If she is Chinese, she could be wearing a mili, a veil that covers the entire body, or a waymo, a shorter veil attached to a hat. This lady is probably carrying Badur al Budur's mili as she is wearing a servant's dress. The waymo, and the waymo extends down about to the shoulders. My picture dropped out. The Wemo is a descendant of the Mili, which was worn by the Tuyuhun women of the Qinghai region of the Northern Silk Road. Of the While the female, female emperor Wu Zetian abolished the Mili, some women in the farther reaches continued to wear it as a protection from the sun, sand, and wind, as well as from prying eyes. How heavily veiled a woman would be could vary according to place, era, and her personal taste. The style that this woman is wearing would be a heavy purple fabric straight over the head. There is a woman wearing the uh, in the way mall when she's riding her horse. Badur al Budur's mother, the Sultana. I'm going to make her a Tang Chinese woman. Let's see if I have it. One. Yeah. I'm going to make her a Tang Chinese woman who practices Buddhism. I'll have her sent by the Emperor Wu Zetian as a peacekeeping bride a political alliance set in place to act variously as advisor and spy. Her parents sent along the servants from her home so that she would not be lonely. Intelligent and capable, she wishes for her daughter to be happy. This is a good time to be a Chinese woman, as the female emperor Wu Zetian has enacted laws to give women more control over their own lives and property. Badur al-Budur's father, the Sultan, a Tocharian nobleman who rose to his position through inheritance. He seems mainly driven by love of wealth. A bit hot-tempered, he pulled his sword on his own daughter when she did not want to tell him how her wedding night went. His favorite hobby is staring at his possessions. He would wear the richest of Tocharian clothing, probably something similar to this image of Prince Lotika's clothing. To the prince's right is his wife, and two Buddhist monks are to his left. The Grand Vizier. 
I actually kind of feel sorry for him, as his son had been engaged to the Sultan's daughter for some time, I think since childhood. And then the Sultan changed things up because Alauddin was super rich. I think to balance his studies and paperwork, the Grand Vizier would enjoy sports such as polo to keep fit. I picture him as having been sent from the imperial court and uh, a good civil servant. After all, Confucian policy is all about balance and filial duty. So you have to take your paperwork and your sports. Achieve balance. The Grand Vizier, I feel, would have worked hard to pass his civil service exams. Here we see the civil service examinees lined up in the great hall waiting much like in colleges have been done for many years, their, uh, their names and their scores will be pasted up on the wall to read them to find out if they passed and if they can get a job working for the Imperial Court. He would have worked hard to pass his civil service exam. And then he was installed at al Qaas to keep an eye on things. He sends regular reports back to the emperor. I think he's married to a local woman. He had hoped that by uniting his daughter to the son of the sultan, he'd be able to enjoy a tidy retirement. Here we see ladies at the area. Fatima, the holy woman. I'm going to say she is Muslim, for at this time there were some women ascat ecstatics who professed the faith. It was not unusual for well-born and wealthy people to invite these holy people to live with and teach them. Fatima would dress in the same style as the more fashionable women, but she would dress more modestly and simply, perhaps more like the woman in the center here. She would wear common fabrics such as cotton rather than exotic silk embroidery. A magician. He is from Morocco, but is posing as the long absent brother of Mustafa, Alauddin's father. He is described as a black man. He looks enough like Alauddin's late father to make their being brothers plausible, although this might have been aided to the use of him. Adept at blending in wherever he goes, he would dress in a similar fashion to the high ranking people men. Here we have an image of a rubbing taken off of a stella, which marked Christian sutras. Religious tolerance was practiced in the capital and extended throughout the province, provinces of China. Laws at this time were enacted to give women greater autonomy and control over their bodies, lives, and possessions. Women could ride. Here a woman is wearing a uh, headpiece that covers most of her but leaves her face open. The arts were flourishing at this time. Lady in her melee again. Another riding. The arts flourished in poetry and in music at this time. So you can see that diversity and multiculturalism were hallmarks of Chinese success in extending hegemony. By remembering this and exploring the Silk Routes, we can bring this richness and diversity to our presentations, depictions, and reenactments. Thank you for watching this presentation. You will find links to supporting material in the notes section of this website. May your own road take you to prosperity and joy.